Welcome to the Cyber Risk Management Podcast. Our mission is to help you thrive as a cyber risk manager. On today's episode, your virtual chief information security officer is Kip Boyle, and your virtual cybersecurity counsel is Jake Bernstein. Visit them at cyberriskopportunities.com and focallaw.com. So, Kip, what are we going to talk about today? Hey, Jake, we're going to look today at um, a new lawsuit, and we're going to see what we can learn about it. It's uh, It was filed by a shareholder of a publicly traded company, and it's filed against the leaders of that same company, and, the, uh, and it has to do with the cybersecurity failures, uh, the recent ones of that company. It, it's the craziest thing as a non-lawyer that I've seen in a long time, um, it, but I think our audience is going to find it fascinating. Yes, and this would be the 104-page complaint you sent to me five minutes before recording time, right? (laughs) Oh, okay. Way to out me. Yeah, okay. So as part of my show prep, I figured you'd want to see the complaint. And yeah, I know it was kind of short notice. But, you know, here's the thing. You're You're a law school graduate. You're an accomplished litigator. And I just figured, you know, you would absorb 104 pages like, you know, like it was nothing. I, I didn't figure it'd be a challenge at all. Well, we'll see how this goes. I've I've absorbed a good portion of it, uh, but there's going to be a, there's what's what's great about this complaint actually is that it is worth uh, I would say detailed study uh, for our audience and and both of us um, because in this hundred four page complaint, though there is a lot of what I would consider you know kind of. Um, standard legalese for a complaint it is it is chock full of very specific and i would say juicy factual allegations um a lot of which actually are redacted now that i continue to scroll through it Um, yeah we can talk about why that is because i i i was kind of surprised by that but um okay but the So for the audience, though, what we're talking about is a complaint that was filed on April 28th, 2020. And um, we are recording this show not too long from from that. So this is all very fresh. And it's um, Laboratory Corporation of America. And when I first saw this, uh, one of the things that caught my eye is I thought of LabMD, which has a long history with FTC uh, over data security problems. And it all started back in 2005 for LabMD with, um, if anybody was around, uh, might remember LimeWire, which was a peer-to-peer file sharing app that actually um, distributed uh, sensitive data throughout the peer-to-peer network because somebody installed it on their computer at LabMD. And, and LimeWire had this very um, uh, prodigious uh, and promiscuous habit of... Um, of sharing files all over the place, ostensibly for music sharing, but ended up being a whole lot of stuff. And LabMD ultimately uh, got into a lot of trouble and caused the FTC uh, quite a bit more trouble than it bargained for, right? Uh, Yes. Uh, LabMD certainly did get into a, um, a fight with the FTC. And I don't think the FTC expected it. Um, You know, oftentimes well, I say almost all the time, the FTC will just get a settlement out and the company will take it. But LabMD chose to fight. Now, one of the things that happened with LabMD is it went up all the way to the 11th Circuit, which again, uh, for the non-lawyers among us, is one court below the U.S. Supreme Court. Uh, the the Circuit Courts of Appeals are, are just one below. And uh, the... the the commentary at first, when this, when the uh, 11th Circuit came out with its decision, which was back in 2018, was uh, a lot of it was, you know, the FTC lost and the FTC's ability to, um, you know, to regulate data security is in danger and all this stuff. And you can probably tell from the tone of my voice that I don't agree with that assessment. <laughs> Oh, but that's great headlines, though, man. That sells a yeah. lot of copy. Well, it, it is good headline, but it's uh, it is it is again typical of uh, you know reporters and and in this case tech reporters, which is even worse, uh, uh, trying to pass judgment on a on a you know a legal case. 
And what they didn't really understand about it is that, um, you know, the, 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 the love and circuit basically said, look, FTC one, we're not even going to talk about whether you can do cybersecurity and privacy regulation, uh, which means that they did not create any kind of circuit split with the third circuit, which held in, uh, the FTC versus, um, uh, why am I blanking on the name? It's, it's in here. Um, Wyndham, the Wyndham Worldwide Corporation case. Yeah, because uh, they challenged FTC also. They did, they, they did, they went down they, swinging. They, they went, yeah, they, they lost, but they just lost completely. Yeah, um, they did. And the Third Circuit in the FTC versus Wyndham basically said, um, you know, the FTC, you can do this. Uh, and the 11th Circuit in LabMD did not, did not even address it. And what the, what the 11th Circuit did say is, okay, FTC, you have to be a little bit more specific. Basically, these injunctions are too vague. And a lot of people at the time were worried that this meant that the reasonableness standard itself was under assault and that the FTC might not be able to continue to use the reasonableness standard. Um, There's two major caveats to this concern. One is that uh, when the FTC settles... It, you, you can't challenge the complaint or you can't challenge the, the kind of the settlement, the consent decree in order for vagueness because you've agreed to it. So presumably you're not going to agree to something if it's too vague for you to comply with. Uh, secondly, the 11th Circuit had this kind of um, unfortunate uh, double, double purpose. It, on the one hand, it wanted to prevent the FTC from micromanaging companies and, and micromanaging the uh, cybersecurity programs. But on the other hand, and this is a directly opposed, you know, paradoxical requirement, it said, this is too vague to be enforceable. The, you're not telling these companies what to do enough, mm. right? So you can't micromanage, but you didn't micromanage enough is essentially <laughs> what the 11th Circuit said. And I think that... Uh, that is where we started to get the at a minimum standard language right. that, we, that we talked about in a recent, uh, recent episode. Yeah, we did. Mm-hmm. Uh, because what the FTC did is like, okay, fine. Um, if you think it's too vague, then we're just going to change things around. And, and like I said, in that, in that episode, they didn't really change things, but they did add, they did add, I'd say, a fair amount of additional information and detail. And I think it's helpful, honestly. Like, I actually think that in the end, the LabMD case was not a bad thing. Um, I guess, by the way, bad here depends upon your point of view. Um, but I don't think that the the FTC was ultimately that troubled by LabMD. You can, you can look at that ruling very narrowly. It does not affect the reasonableness standard. And it basically says you guys have to be a little bit more uh, descriptive in your injunction writing. And, and largely they have. So okay. uh, I don't, I don't think it's a big deal. Um, but this is not lab MD lab MD is small potatoes. Lab MD was not publicly traded. This is laboratory corporation of America, AKA lab corp yep. uh, for which millions and millions of people, myself included have received invoices. Uh, it's almost oh, yeah. it's almost impossible to not uh, to get um, any kind of medical test and and not at some point meet up with LabCorp. So I just paid one the other day. <laughs> exactly. So okay. So you know, why don't you tell us why this jumped out at you? Right. Okay. So again, just to recap. So when I saw this, I the first thing was like, oh my gosh, LabMD, you know, is doing something which kind of surprised me because they're actually out of business. And as you said, we're, we're never publicly traded. So once I realized, oh, it's not LabMD, I was like, um, okay, well, okay, it's LabCorp, but I'm still interested. And the reason why is because 12 of LabCorp's executives and directors are named as defendants in this complaint, including the CEO, the CFO, and the CIO. And guess what? In my work as a chief information security officer, those are the people that I am regularly advising on cyber risk management. So 
you know, so I was like, holy moly, like this is so relevant to my work. And I figured, you know, uh, that our audience is probably talking to the people in those positions on a regular basis as well. And so, you know, that's kind of what, um, you know, really got me interested. And then the other thing that kind of stuck out to me is this uh, idea of a shareholder derivative complaint. And, and as a non-lawyer, my first reaction is like, you know, hubba what? Like, I, I didn't know what that was, but but it was weird, and 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 that also caught my eye. But let's take a short detour, and Jake, tell us what is a shareholder derivative complaint? Sure. So so uh, I believe we may have mentioned this in another episode we, where we talked about the business judgment rule. Yeah, um, I'd have to go into the vault to find that though. Yeah, totally. Uh, but essentially, uh, the shareholder a shareholder derivative lawsuit is a mechanism by which shareholders of a publicly traded company, although it doesn't need to be a publicly traded company. Um, so shareholders of a corporation sue on behalf of that corporation and they're suing the, usually it's the board of directors and, or the officers as is the case here. That's, that's who the target is. And mm. what, what the case is ultimately saying is uh, you, the directors and officers breached your fiduciary duties to the corporation. And because, because a corporation is a legal fiction and cannot act on its own, you know, it has to either act through, it always has to act through agents. Normally, those agents are the directors and officers, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. And so uh, the derivative lawsuit is, is, when, is, is one of the few ways in which a shareholder can take a direct action on behalf of the company that they hold shares in. And it's interesting, you only have to own one share to be a, to be a valid shareholder derivative plaintiff. Wow. Um, and, uh, what it is, is, is it's, it's meant for, uh, trying to hold the leadership and the directors responsible for the in many, usually mismanagement in some way of the company. And that is exactly what this case is about. Um, so for my in my, my so my non lawyer brain says okay I need to find some other way to think about this and so one way that I've started thinking about it is this um, uh, you know so uh, let's say I'm the guardian or the parent of of a child and I and I have to put my child into the care of a guardian for whatever reason and the guardian I think screws up and so in a way I sort of like say okay you know like guardian I'm like totally pissed at you you're you're screwing up all over the place I'm going to file a lawsuit on behalf of my child and deal with you I mean I know this that would never happen because it doesn't work that way but but it, again in my non-lawyer brain I'm like is it kind of sort of like that um so here let's 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 twist your uh, your hypothetical around a little bit uh, a a a more likely circumstance would be the court appoints a guardian who sues the parent on behalf of the child because the ah. parent, because the parent is being a bad parent. There you um, go. That is, that is what would more realistically happen. And yeah, it's similar. Um, it's a situation where the entity who needs to have rights um, exercised can't do it on its own, either because it is a minor or because it is a, legal fiction, which is what a corporation is. Right. Um, and so okay. that is what this is. Okay. Uh, Members of the audience, if that helped you, I'm glad. If that just made everything worse, I'm sorry. Let's keep going. So let's talk, let's talk about the, the some of the details of the lawsuit. So the lawsuit alleges that LabCorp's leadership, right, the people, the 12 people, that they failed to address cybersecurity weaknesses and that they failed to adequately notify uh, data breach victims and shareholders about two specific incidents. And as a result, the lawsuit wants the senior decision makers to be held accountable for damages. They also want to force the company to make changes to its governance to prevent future data breaches. So that's kind of like a thumbnail sketch of what's going on. I'm sure it's way more hairy and complicated than that. But again, I'm going to go back to my question. So when I'm working as a chief information security officer, should I have should I worry about myself being named in a lawsuit like this or is there something I should be doing to help protect the you know the executives that I'm advising, right? This is what I want to know. So I mean, that's a really interesting question and we probably could spend multiple episodes talking about it and maybe we will. Um, but you know, I think there's a, uh, there's a couple of ways to answer that first. Uh, 
I think if you're part of the C-suite, you are potentially a valid target uh, in a derivative lawsuit. So if you're a CISO, now it depends on the structure, right? If you're if you're if your title is CISO, but you actually are one of the CISOs that reports to the CIO, maybe not. Maybe mm-hmm. you aren't a valid target, but let's say you're a powerful CISO with uh, who's like a peer of the realm. You know, okay, the re- so if I report directly to the CEO, that makes me a peer of the CFO and the CIO. And so that creates more exposure for me. Uh, yeah, it does. Uh, I think, you know, with great power comes great responsibility. And Says those out there to just realize that, you know, you may get what you wish for and more. Yeah. Uh, and and just to be clear, it doesn't, you know, reporting to the CIO or someone else before you get to the CEO is not a guarantee that you're not going to be named. It, it really is highly fact dependent. Uh, but the the real kind of question here that I think you asked, which is how do we you know, what should we be doing to protect the, you know, the rest of the C-suite from these types of, these types of lawsuits? And, you know, I think that is, that's one of the questions that, that CISOs have been asking for a long time. And I think it's not so much that the CISOs haven't been doing their jobs. It's that the CISOs haven't been listened to. And this actually is the type of complaint that is bound to change behavior uh, and actually is probably likely to result in CISOs being heard more. Because mm-hmm. I don't know about you, but I don't know many CISOs who, I don't know many true CISOs who are worthy of the title, who um, don't stay up at night worrying about cybersecurity and what's going on at their company. Generally speaking, the stories you hear, and this is a gross generalization, uh, are about the CISO not getting the resources or the CISO not getting the exposure or getting listened to or being allowed yeah. to speak to the board. And really what this, what this lawsuit is, is a massive, uh, you know, I would say shot across the bow of every director and officer and board that doesn't regularly get cybersecurity updates from the CISO or the, and the CISO's team. Because what this lawsuit does is say, you all mismanage because you didn't pay enough attention to cybersecurity. I mean, and that's, mm. a, again, that's a simplification, but, but it's an appropriate one. Right. Okay. So, um, so that's why LabCorp leadership were named as defendants in this lawsuit. And what we've talked about for a long time is, is that they have a duty to uh, pay attention, right. To just cyber risk management and um, data security and privacy um, and they can delegate that, which, you know, most of, most all of them do, but they cannot, um, you know, they, they can delegate, delegate responsibility, but they cannot delegate the, the bottom line accountability. Right. And just, just to be clear, you're, you always name the, the whole point of a shareholder derivative lawsuit is to name the officers and directors in some fashion or another. So that's definitional of a, of a shareholder okay. derivative suit. And, uh, and and because of that, if I'm not mistaken, there's actually insurance that corporations routinely purchase to protect their directors and officers from these kinds of things, right? Uh, there is, yes. And I'm sure that LabCorp has it. Uh, I think what's interesting, though, is this is... I don't want to say this is... It's not fundamentally different than a lot of situations. A lot of the times you know, what gets people in trouble is either self-dealing or enriching yourself over over the company or kind of uh, violations of the duty of loyalty. Um, uh, but in this situation, this is really, this really, this really goes to the heart of, of being a board of directors and being officers because it goes to the core question of ultimate accountability for cybersecurity. And this is something that we have talked about a lot. And in fact, we've mentioned the term shareholder derivative complaint for years. I think what's, and and this is just a very, this is a current example uh, of a very well thought out, very long complaint that is exactly that. And I think it is, you know, you've seen these after the other kind of major public breaches, uh, Target, obviously Wyndham, Home Depot. Um, and, it, you know, I think those, 
those were older enough that the facts are going to be a little different. And I think, and, and again, we've talked about the business judgment rule, but at this point, so the, the interesting thing about the business judgment rule and, and most of these types of cases is that, you know, the standard by which you shall be judged changes. And the business judgment rule with respect to cybersecurity in 2015 is going to be meaningfully different than the same the same question in 2020. And is that because due care changes? Like it's, what's it's because due care changes. Uh, it's because the duty of care changes uh, as the situation, uh, as technology and everything revolves. It, you just have to think about it in the, the same way that you'd think about duty of care of a of a physician, right? Um, 35, 40 years ago, you know, the duty of care was, you know, you would, um, uh, I'm, this is where I start to speak of things about things that I do not know. Well, there's uh, new treatments now than there was 50 years ago. Exactly. There's, there's constantly new treatments. There's new things all the time. Uh, here I can do, I can do one better just cause you've mentioned it before, uh, way long ago, you know, washing, not washing your hands was not considered a failure of the duty of care. Right. Right. Um, right. But uh, in fact, that is a very simple and straightforward violation of the duty of care these days for a medical professional. Um, And in this situation that, you know, in 2015 uh, or certainly go back in 2010, just five, five, five years earlier. And I think that the courts are going to have a very, very different view of the duty of care related to cybersecurity and privacy programs in 2020 though. And, and this lawsuit, you know, specifically calls it out. All of these people were aware of cybersecurity issues, and in fact, uh, LabCorp has been had been in the news, had gotten attention of the wrong variety for its kind of poor cybersecurity practices over over time. So, all of the board members and the officers knew. There's almost no way that they could argue they didn't know, and they there was failure of reporting. Uh, failure to disclose. Uh, the only place that it was disclosed at times was in the the, the SEC filings, and I, I think that the I, I think that the lawsuit ultimately is saying your mismanagement is now exposing the company for which I am a shareholder to significant financial loss. And if you unpack that. You know, we've again. This this is uh, this ties in very well to our business judgment rule uh, episode, because if you recall from that that discussion, corporate law basically requires that corporations seek to maximize shareholder value, and when you are paying out millions of dollars in class action damages, you're not doing a good job of maximizing shareholder value, and. Essentially, what this lawsuit comes down to is your mismanagement is why we're paying out millions of dollars in a class action lawsuit. So it, it, on the one hand, yes, it's 104 pages. It's very complicated. But, but on the other hand, it, it's really not. Uh, it is something that we as security professionals have been banging the drums about for decades, which is take this stuff seriously effective cybersecurity starts at the top and oftentimes cannot be successful unless it comes from the top. This is not something that you can do as a ground up type of uh, right. project. So this, this, is, this continues the evolution of the chorus of voices that are, that are saying to senior decision makers, I don't care if you don't know how to turn on a computer, this is important and, you, and you've got to start paying attention to it. So, I mean, so I, I think this is good. I think it's bad for you though, because I handed you a 104 page complaint five minutes before the show and look what you've done with it. Like you've totally, yeah. you've totally torn it apart, reduced it to its essence and explained it very succinctly to the audience. Well done. Well, thank you. Uh, I, I, I think it is worthwhile to, uh, look at some details here. You, you, uh, you prepared this, this script and we should use this part of it. And I I just want to talk through real fast. Some of the allegations. Now, like I said, it is a long complaint, uh, but some of the specific allegations are interesting and everyone will have heard them before and they can be tied right into the NIST cybersecurity framework. So for example, in the identify function, uh, the lawsuit says, 
that the leadership failed to implement and enforce a system of effective internal controls and procedures to protect patient information. That's textbook out of textbook. the framework. In, under, the, under what would be the detect function, failing to exercise their oversight duties by not monitoring LabCorp's compliance with its own procedures and federal and state regulations. Yeah. Uh, protect was uh, providing PII and PHI, that's, per, that's a private health information, or personal health information of patients to a HIPAA business associate with deficient cybersecurity and breach detection. So just to be clear, that is, we didn't mention it yet, but the breach, there's two breaches involved in this case. Uh, one of them for sure, the, the first breach is, was a, uh, a supply chain breach. The collection agency that LabCorp used uh, was was compromised and, and made mistakes. <clears throat> Pardon me, made mistakes. Uh, so, so this is a uh, this is one failure of those to protect failure to protect failure to monitor your third party vendors, et cetera, et cetera. Um, now, this one's really basic. Uh, I I let you guess which uh, which of the five functions this one falls under. <laughs> Failing to have a sufficient incident response plan to immediately respond to data breaches. There's that R word, respond. Yep, twice, yes. And then uh, the last one, of course, is recover, disregarding, delaying, and failing to ensure that the company notified all potentially affected individuals and entities in a timely manner upon discovering the data breaches. They just didn't do that. So, you know, this is a, this is a case, this is a gr- an amazing case study in, in how our legal system is going to hold, I, I would say, more and more corporate leadership groups accountable for cybersecurity failures. Mm. Okay. All right. So this is, uh, this is just as interesting as it, as it seemed to me when I first saw it. And I hope that uh, our audience is, um, is, you know, getting a lot of value out of this. Um, there's another thing about this case that's a little different, which is, um, is that, um, when you, you had mentioned before that there were derivative suits in the Target data breach, the Wyndham, and the Home Depot data breaches, what's different about this one I noticed is that this is this is a um, this is based on a data breach that didn't actually happen inside of LabCorp's um, area of control, but actually happened uh, while data was in the hands of a third party service provider. And, um, so that's, that's pretty different. Wouldn't you agree? Uh, yes and no. I think that if you look at the time, I mean, a little, it's, I'd say it's a little bit of, of perspective shifting, you know, the, the target data breach. Yes, it did happen inside of target, but it happened through a third party vendor. I, I don't know that the, uh, distinction here is, is worth drawing. I honestly think that the difference is the timing it's it's just 2020 is a is different than 2015 when it comes to this these issues and i think that's what makes it interesting and and i think you know one one thing that that we haven't talked about that we should is what is okay so so what right this happened yeah. what does this mean and i just happened to scroll through here and i i i ended up at paragraph 54 uh, on page 19, talking about the compensation to uh, David King, who was the uh, who was the CEO. Now he is uh, now he is the director of the company. And uh, according to the 2020 proxy statement in 2019, so this is all publicly filed. This is what the uh, this is what publicly traded companies have to do. Uh-huh. Uh, Mr. King received total compensation of 12.933 million dollars, and what the lawsuit is going to seek uh, is some of that money back. Honestly, basically, basically, what happens is is there's a couple of things that the that the plaintiffs want. One, they ultimately they want the company that they are a stockholder for to not lose money on pointless things like lawsuits and uh, issues uh, issues related to poor cybersecurity management caused by you know potentially negligent management, and so. One of the things, the money side is, I'm sorry, strike that. One of the things they obviously want is the company to be ordered to adjust its cybersecurity behavior, right? Mm-hmm. So, so they're actually looking to be told to do more on cybersecurity. Uh, 
and that's obviously good for the company. Uh, and it's not really, I mean, you could call it a punishment of the, of, of the defendants, the actual defendants, but it, it's kind of not, uh, what is the punishment is that they're going to seek to be whole, to be held financially responsible. So in addition to potentially having to pay from their own pocket, the, uh, you know, potential damages from the, from the, uh, the class actions, they'll also potentially have to pay the attorney's fees for the plaintiffs in this case. And, you know, when these, the reason that they target the officers and directors is not so much the directors, but the officers are often paid substantial salaries and, uh, and get stock awards. And, you know, should they profit, they, they should pay when they cause damage to the corporation is, is the theory. And so, and so, yeah, I mean, are these people going to go to jail? No, that's not how this works. Uh, are they going to have to pay a bunch of money back to the company? They might. And I think okay, that's so a big deal. Be a clawback. I mean, it's damages. It's ultimately right. damages. Uh, it's not really a clawback. That's a, that has a specific legal meaning in many uh. situations. Uh, but, but outside of legal profession, yes, you could call it a clawback. They're paying back. They're, they're giving money back to the company. Uh, they're basically having to pay the company's expenses that they cost. Right. Out of the money that they earned from the serving the company. Exactly. Okay. Okay. Yeah. I mean, when I look at my checking account, it looks like a clawback. <laughs> money came in, money went back out. Yeah. Um, that, okay. So that's, that is how I think about it. But I didn't know that that was actually a, um, a specific term uh, legally. So that's helpful to know. All it's, right. It, so yeah, it has a different context, but we'll ignore that for now. Okay, so you think that's the worst case scenario for the depend for the defendants here is that um, they might actually um, have to pay some of the damages uh, or some of the expenses of the of the corporation. Um, are their careers over if that happens? Uh, you know, I don't know. Um, it would really depend on on the shareholders' ability. I mean, possibly, but possibly not. I think that is a that's a different question entirely. Um, I wish we had the insur- an insurance person on. Uh, as a guest right now, because this, because one, one angle that I'm thinking about is if I am on the, if I'm an officer and I'm on the losing end of this kind of a lawsuit and I pay damages, then like, could I even be insured again if I became the officer of a new corporation and they wanted to get directors and officers liability insurance and name me as an insured? Like, would anybody actually allow me to be an insured? Would it, would an insurance carrier you know, look in my background and say, oh, yeah, you know, he's a good risk. Let's put him on the policy. You know, I don't know. It, I, 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 don't, I don't know, actually, is the, uh, is the answer. But it does strike me that, um, you know, maybe, could be, uh, uh, these people's careers could be over. Um, but well, maybe, if there are, but maybe in, not. If there are, okay, well, if, any, if anybody in the audience would like to weigh in on that, I'd love to hear um, your, your take on it, particularly if you work in insurance or if you've got a specific experience with something like this. So uh, shoot us a message if you have something you can add. Agreed. Well, I think we probably should wrap up this episode, Kip. Yeah, yeah. Actually, um, we are uh, pretty much right on time. So today uh, on the episode, we saw how a third-party cybersecurity failure resulted in a shareholder derivative lawsuit that named company senior decision makers as defendants We're way early in this, so we don't know how it's going to turn out, but we'll keep an eye on it for you and let you know what happens. So until then, we'll see you next time. See you next time. Thanks for joining us today on the Cyber Risk Management Podcast. Remember that cyber risk management is a team sport, so include your senior decision makers, legal department, HR, and IT for full effectiveness. So if you want to manage cyber as the dynamic business risk it has become, we can help. Find out more by visiting us at cyberriskopportunities.com and focallaw.com. Thanks for tuning in. See you next time.